Hey David and hi to the Eclectic Book Club and anybody else who is joining in on our journey of reading the Iliad, which is our book club pick for December. Very Christmassy with all of the, the fighting and the dying and the pride and so on and so forth. Okay, so I wanna talk about a couple of different things today. And David, you asked me a really good question and you brought up a really good point. So I'm gonna to get to all of it. First of all, I felt as I was reading through the Robert Graves translation that I wasn't getting it still. And that is incredibly frustrating for me. I was still struggling with the major players and the essential concept that you have all of these gods of varying strengths and um, have varying talents and abilities. And they're kind of up here in this section, you know, up here. And then they converse, argue, convince one another to do these things. And then those actions trickle down to the armies of the Trojan, the Trojans and the Achaeans. And it took me a, a good while to like really grasp that that was going on. And so there's this huge difference between when a god is fighting or when a god is involved in the battles and when the people, like the mere mortals, are, um, are fighting in a battle. And I don't know why it took me a minute to grasp that, to just understand the major players. I think part of it is that Homer is just drops you in. And depending on what translation you have, the translator may or, not, may or may not be kind to the reader when it comes to explaining who these people are. So I was reading Robert Graves and I think that if I had a slight bit more understanding of how the Greek world and mythology worked, I think I would have been fine with that. Um, but me being me, I was like, I think it's the translation and it's not, it's not me. It's the translation. It's not me, it's you, okay? And so I was like, let me just try Fitzgerald. And so I don't know if it was because it was the fourth or fifth time that I had read book one and two and three, but this, um, it seemed to click. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting a really good idea of who the major players are and what the major themes are and the major events, you know, throughout, throughout the story. So that, that felt like an achievement. So I feel like I'm smooth sailing with the Fitzgerald translation and it is definitely my favorite. It is written in, it is written in, po in um, poetry, in verse rather, and, but it reads like prose. It's very, very good. Um, and the, the language is gorgeous um, and it's just very, very readable and very understandable. So I'm very excited. I'm, how many times can I say very? I'm very excited to have Fitzgerald's translation of the Iliad. Okay, so that was the first thing. The second thing is this idea of rereading that you brought up, David. I love this idea. I have a feeling, well, first of all, because I have reread the first three chapters of the Iliad or three books of the Iliad, um, I've, I've reread them at least three times this month already. And every time as I have been working to understand what this text and the context and what it's about and why it's existed for so long, all these questions that I have kind of swirling on in my brain as I'm reading, I've gotten a better understanding of who the major, who the major players are, who are, who our major characters are and what this is all about, along with understanding the way that Greek society, ancient Greek society works, um, their values and <laughs> the way that they treat one another. Okay. So I, but I was thinking about this idea of rereading and I used to reread a lot as a kid and I've reread some this year. Actually, it wasn't, I, I revisited authors that I personally didn't have the best relationship with and I revisited their work, new works to me, but you know, more in their collection or in their body of work. And that has been really wonderful because I have noticed that as I've grown as a reader, much like what you said, David, you know, if you visit something, revisit something every year, you, uh, there are things that you see in it that you didn't see prior, that you didn't understand or that you didn't quite see in that way in your previous reading. And I think that with the Iliad, I'm, I'm probably going to reread it 
many times <laughs> because there's so much going on and Fitzgerald, this translation in particular, along with the, the Fagel's translation, has gorgeous language in it. So it's on multiple levels, it's challenging. It's challenging with the language that they use. It's challenging, what are you doing? It's challenging with this, the story that they're telling and it's fascinating. And so I fully support your idea of rereading. Now you asked me this question of whose side am I on? And I really wanted to say that I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, I really enjoy Hector but I feel like I should be rooting for Achilles. I feel, you know, Achilles is our protagonist in the Iliad and I feel like I should be rooting for him. But the person that, the character that I'm most uh, intrigued by is Hector. But beyond who am I rooting for, I wanted to think about some of the major themes. Um, and I wanted to kind of volley this back to you and to everybody else. What themes are, have stood out to you? So I'm gonna actually talk about book nine. So in book nine, Agamemnon decides that he wants to possibly come up with a peaceful solution. And this is done by giving Achilles wealth, to, to, a solution to stop the fighting and to end this, this battle. And he offers uh, women and um, riches and offers up a truce to Achilles. And as Achilles um, hears about this truce, as it's uh, presented to him, he vehemently denies it. And I was thinking about these themes of honor, about pride, and about shame. <laughs> and I keep on seeing this throughout. It is honorable, in at least from what I'm getting with the Fitzgerald translation of the Iliad, um, I, it's honorable to fight and to kill and to fight to the death. It is shameful to possibly take a truce, to settle for less, or to be peaceful, which is so interesting um, as a comparison to nowadays. Nowadays, it's really honorable to come up with a truce and to not have any fighting involved. It's honorable to have a forgiving heart. Um, but honor doesn't mean that in ancient Greek society. Honor means something very, very different. And I keep on thinking about the way different cultures uh, approach honor. Um, for example, earlier, earlier in the year I read Unbroken and the way that the Japanese thought it would be honorable was to die, to, to, to be killed before a soldier is um, uh, captured as a, as a prisoner of war. Um, and that is that would be more honorable. It would be to dishon it would be dishonorable to be captured as a POW. It would bring dishonor on your family and on your country, according to the Japanese in Lauren Hill and Brands Unbroken. Um, and so, so that is very different. Whereas during also during World War II, it is honorable to stay alive, <laughs> uh, according to the United States. Um, to our our code of conduct. And so in this a book unbroken the main character is um, taken as a prisoner of war to a Japanese uh, Japanese POW camp and treated atrociously and a lot of it had to do with the cultural differences about the way they saw honor um, because the Japanese POW camp thought that the those soldiers that were captured were doing the, one of the most dishonorable things that a soldier could do by being captured and by being a prisoner of the other side. So that was really interesting. And then I was thinking about pride. Um, there is no merit to humility in the Iliad. So as in book nine, as um, Achilles was telling this messenger no to Agamemnon on this truce that was presented, some of it is his pride. He feels righteous in his anger. And that is fascinating to me as well, because you think about another very, very old text, the Bible. And there's that metaphor of when somebody offers an olive branch as a form of truce or a form of peace, you take it 
because it takes a lot for somebody, their pride, their ego to say, hey, here's something. And it would, and it, it's gonna take a lot of your honor, pride, ego, setting it aside and saying, I will accept that and we're good. Um, and I just thought that that was so fascinating. So as I'm reading, I'm constantly thinking about these themes and I need, I, 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 not I need, I would love to hear you all talk about the themes that you've been seeing um, or development of the ideas that I've already presented. So this idea of honor and pride and shame. And it seems to be all connected to being a warrior and to killing and to killing for your side and um, and so on and so forth, which again, both seems familiar and also very foreign at the same time. Such a an interesting read. So in regards to rereading, I think I'll probably reread this and the themes I've been thinking about, I've mentioned. So just tell me, what where, what do you guys see? What are you getting out of it? What themes do you see? And David, I really want to hear what kind of themes are emerging from this read of the Iliad. So that's it from me. Um, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye, guys. Bye.